we'll jump. Follow my lead. I got a plan. Like hell we will. No, it'll be okay. You can't fight nature, Captain. You can't fight gravity. While this scene from 1969's Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid may not be entirely historically accurate, it didn't stop Rockstar Games from basing Red Dead Redemption 2's Dutch Vandalin and his gang on the real-life Butch Cassidy and his Wild Bunch. In fact, Rockstar took several influences throughout the game, so let's take a look at the real history of Red Dead Redemption 2. Butch Cassidy was said to be a natural-born leader, charming mostly everyone he met. A familiar description to any of the followers of Dutch Vandalin, said to be an exuberant and charismatic figure. The influences go deeper than personalities, however. In June 1899, Butch Cassidy and the Wild Bunch robbed a Union Pacific train in Wilcox, Wyoming. Meanwhile, also in 1899, the Vandalin gang robbed the private train of Leviticus Cornwall in Emberino. The Wild Bunch flagged down the train before it could cross a bridge, but the Vandalin gang's faulty dynamite failed to stop the train and they were forced to manually board and stop it. Both gangs used dynamite, the Wild Bunch to blow open the safe inside the train and the Vandalin gang to blow open Cornwall's private railcar. Cassidy and gang escaped with cash and valuables worth as much as $36,000, while Dutch and gang escaped with some expensive bonds and valuables. But neither gang was completely out of trouble. E. H. Harriman, an American railroad executive who was chairman of the Union Pacific Railroad's executive committee, hired the Pinkerton Detective Agency to track down the Wild Bunch. In the game, Cornwall does the same, hiring the Pinkertons to track down the Vandalin gang. Both in-game and in real life, the Pinkertons were brutal in their approach, stopping at nothing to reach their targets. In Red Dead Redemption 2, the Pinkertons kidnap, torture and kill those affiliated with the gang, and aren't afraid to mount attacks that would kill even the gang's more innocent members. In real life, things seemed a little more extreme. In an attempt to subdue the outlaw Jesse James, Pinkertons raided his homestead by throwing an incendiary device. However, James was not home and the explosion killed his younger half-brother and blew off his mother's right arm. After being subdued by the Pinkertons, Butch Cassidy and Harry Longabau, better known as the Sundance Kid, fled to South America, where they were later said to have been killed. A similar event happens in the game, where after a failed bank robbery and continued pursuit by the Pinkertons, Dutch and some gang members flee on a boat to Cuba, but end up shipwrecked on the island of Guam. Guam itself appears to be based on the country of Cuba, despite Cuba also existing within the game. Military leader Thaddeus Waxman led the troops at the Battle of San Juan Hill in Guam. In real life, this battle occurred in Cuba and the troops were led by Theodore Roosevelt Jr. Both real and fictional rebels had waged campaigns for decades for freedom from colonial rule. In real life, Cubans were rebelling against Spain, while in the game, Guamans were rebelling against Cuba. Just as Theodore Roosevelt became President of the United States following the assassination of William McKinley, Thaddeus Waxman became President after the assassination of Alfred McAllister. There are even more parallels between the two figures too, like that the fictional Waxman, named Colonel William Thomas Kirshner, the Chief Engineer of the Panama Canal Project in 1907, just as Roosevelt had done with the US Army General George Washington Goethals. Waxman also predicted that over one million immigrants would arrive in Ellis Island in New York, which in real life ultimately did happen. Some other side characters you might recognize are the Aberdeens. Living in their pig farm in Lemoyne, Bray and Tammy Aberdeen are siblings and lovers. Well, ain't this a rare treat? During the game, the siblings invite the player inside for dinner, and if they accept, feed them a drink that knocks them out. When the player awakens, they find themselves in a mass grave. They're clearly not the first victim of the Aberdeen siblings. Fascinatingly, the Aberdeens are seemingly based on a real life family of serial killers known as the Bloody Benders. The family, consisting of John Bender, his wife Elvira, and their children Kate and John Jr., murdered at least a dozen travelers between 1869 and 1873 by hosting them at their inn and offering them a meal before knocking them out and murdering them. At least nine bodies were found buried around the inn. Oh, and siblings Kate and John Jr. were reported to be lovers, of course. Further south in the state of Lemoyne, 
players will find themselves in the settlement of Rhodes, a town plagued by the war between two plantation families, the Braithwaites and the Greys. The feud started in 1806, when the two families believed that the other had stolen their treasure, when in reality, lovers Lucille Braithwaite and Douglas Gray had taken the money to help finance local groups fighting to end slavery. The dispute could have been inspired by any number of family feuds from the 1800s, but the one that seems to have the most parallels is the Jones-Liddell feud. This feud had different origins. St. John Richardson Liddell blamed Charles Jones for an injury he wasn't directly responsible for, but both were fueled by speculation, as rumours spread that Jones was plotting a revenge attack on Liddell. After the war, Liddell's plantation was in financial ruin, and he was forced to put it up for auction. Jones, however, did not suffer the same troubles, and even began negotiations to purchase Liddell's property. In the game, both families were financially damaged by abolition, but it seemed that the Greys were a little better off, as they owned the Rhodes Parlour House and ran the local sheriff's office. Ultimately, Liddell was assassinated by Jones and his sons, and in revenge, Jones was killed by a mob who wanted justice. With that, the feud was over. In the game, the Vandaline gang kill most members of both families. Matriarch Catherine Braithwaite dies running back into her burning manor, and Patriarch Tavish Grey kills himself at his home. And with that, their feud was done. An interesting feature in the game is that law enforcement will pursue and capture the player if they are caught harming a domestic animal like a cat or a dog. What's interesting about it is that federal anti-animal cruelty laws weren't implemented until the Animal Welfare Act of 1966, over half a century after the events of the main game, though all Union states had some statute by 1907, so perhaps this gameplay feature isn't entirely historically inaccurate. Speaking of animals, it's fascinating how accurate the birds are in this game. There's a really interesting piece written by Nicholas Lund for the National Audubon Society that I recommend checking out. In the game, the player can shoot as many birds as they like with no negative repercussions, besides a slight drop in honour, and the feathers can be used for crafting and clothing. This pretty closely imitates the real life culture of 1899, as birds were typically viewed as something to exploit rather than appreciate, as was most of the natural world really. Feathers were used for clothing and crafting. Egret plumes in particular were used for fancy hats, which might be familiar to players of one of the side missions in Saint Denis. Animal habitats were destroyed by the industrial age, ultimately leading to extinctions of some species, such as the Carolina parakeet, which is present in the game but went extinct shortly afterwards in the early 20th century. The human industrial impact is evident in the game too, specifically in cities like Saint Denis, but even in smaller areas like Owangila. Thankfully, Congress eventually passed the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918. The women's suffrage movement was a decades-long effort to allow women the right to vote. Such a powerful movement is difficult to ignore when retelling the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and Rockstar did not avoid the topic in Red Dead Redemption 2. Players may be familiar with Dorothea Wicklow, a suffragette preaching for women's rights to vote outside the Taylor in San Denis. This is meant to be the land of liberty? But somehow, I am not free to vote? Who says that? Wicklow appears to be based on Sophia Duleep Singh, a prominent British activist who was famously photographed selling the magazine The Suffragette outside her home in 1913. Of course, the player actively participates in a woman's suffrage march in the game's third chapter, driving the wagon through the main streets of Rhodes. We're mothers, wives, housekeepers and daughters. We cook the food and we fetch the water, singing songs of Such an event would not have been particularly uncommon at the time, as local chapters of the suffrage movement had also campaigned for the right to vote. Encouragingly, Arthur's participation in the rally isn't entirely historically inaccurate either. Many men were quite vocal in their support of the women's suffrage movement at the time, including Frederick Douglass and George Francis Train. Of course, inequality in the late 19th century extended far beyond women, and Red Dead Redemption 2 makes no secret of it. You'll likely be familiar with the small groups of Ku Klux Klan members that can be found throughout the game world. Small groups are essentially what made up the KKK in 1899. The first clan was suppressed in the 1870s, and the second didn't emerge until the 1910s and 20s, so they mostly existed as small militia groups at that stage. Due to their limited numbers, they weren't really performing major racially motivated acts, but instead were meeting in small private locations. In the game, the KKK can be seen burning crosses, or at least attempting to. 
If we're going to be pedantic though, and what will these videos be if not pedantic, a lot of these depictions are historically inaccurate. Firstly, cross burning was first introduced to the KKK by Thomas Dixon Jr. in his novel The Klansman, which was published in 1905, six years after it is depicted in the game. And the white costumes and hoods weren't introduced until the second clan in the 1910s, believed to have been inspired by the popular film The Birth of a Nation. Outside of these small unnamed KKK clusters were some named allies of the clan, such as the Red Shirts and the White League. The White League was a paramilitary group made up of Confederate veterans in Louisiana that targeted mostly everyone who stood in their way, but primarily, of course, African Americans. In the game, you might recognize these as Lemoyne Raiders, a group of ex-Confederate soldiers from Lemoyne willing to attack anyone against them. This mindset wasn't exactly uncommon in the South after the American Civil War. Gang member Lenny Summers makes mention of it to Arthur not long after they've moved camp further into Lemoyne. Might call you a nigger lover. They see us riding like this. But most of it is a, a glance or a word. And after that, a visit in the night. This isn't just an opinion held by the game though. Historian Rayford Logan considered 1901 and the 24 years before it, the lowest point for black people in America. He cited several reasons, such as that the presidents during this period had essentially supported and promoted white supremacy, that Booker T. Washington's 1895 Atlantic Compromise, an agreement that Southern black people would submit to white political rule, was unfair, and that the media portrayal had dehumanized and stereotyped African Americans heavily. The game's 1899 setting positions it right towards the crux of this low point for African Americans, so Lenny's complaints are not only valid, but also historically accurate. My father was a colored man. He told me he lived with our people for a while. A number of free men did, but when we were forced to move from our lands, the three of us fled. A couple years later, some soldiers captured my mother, took her somewhere. We never saw her again. Sadly, this was the life forced upon the Native Americans. In the 19th century, the Indian Removal Act forced the Native Americans to leave their ancestral homelands and move to a designated territory known as a reservation. This is discussed in the game too, where the Wapiti Indians, who once freely roamed around the heartlands, signed a treaty which forced them to move to a reservation. Unfortunately, life on a reservation did not necessarily guarantee safety. In the game, business tycoon Leviticus Cornwall made an agreement with the US Army to drive the Wapiti Indians off their reservation so he could drill for oil. To force them off the land, the army uses intimidation tactics stealing their horses, vandalizing their sacred places, and withholding medical supplies, until they are ultimately forced to flee to Canada to avoid persecution. All of these events in the game could really be based on any number of real events. Like with Cornwall and the oil, petroleum developer Henry Foster received privileges from the Bureau of Indian Affairs to search the Osage Reservation in Oklahoma for oil and gas, though at least in this case he paid the tribe a 10% royalty on all sales of the petroleum. As far as intimidation tactics go, the US government went so far as to launch a war in the Black Hills to obtain gold from Native American lands. The Wapiti Indians' retreat to Canada was also based on a historical event. Facing certain death or defeat towards the end of the Black Hills War after the US sent thousands of additional soldiers, Sitting Bull refused to surrender and led much of the Lakota tribe across the border into Canada. By the time the Native American lands had been overrun by the government, the Old West was nearing its end. The American conquest was nearly complete. For every Native American, there were 40 whites. In 1890, the US census showed that the frontier had nowhere else to go. The Civil War was over, farmers had settled, and laws were commonplace. The age of gunslingers was coming to an end. Pell Hart was arrested in June 1899. Butch Cassidy fled the country in February 1901. Tom Horn was hanged in November 1903. In fact, the romanticized myth of the Wild West started before the frontier was over. People wanted to make sure that the magic of the time wasn't lost. But America had settled, and the true industrial age had begun. The death and decline of the Old West leaves a heavy toll on the story of Red Dead Redemption 2, to the point where the game opens with an explanation of this. The evolving world has no place for outlaws and gunslingers, two foundations that held the Vandal and gang afloat for so long. Gangs are dying, and they're feeling the impact. Dutch's downfall only accelerated the gang's death. In the rapidly changing world, it likely didn't have much time left anyway. Speaking of not having much time left, 
In the final chapter of the main game, Arthur is diagnosed with tuberculosis. The doctor tells him that the best thing is rest and getting somewhere warm and dry and taking it easy. At the turn of the 20th century, this was the closest thing they had to a cure. Doctors were told tuberculosis patients to move out west to live in the mountains, where the air was pure and the climate was dry. That was the best thing for a tuberculosis patient. Let them live their final years, months or days in peace, isolated from others. Now to take a step away from the historical accuracy for a moment, I think it's important to discuss the medical and social aspects of tuberculosis that Rockstar got right in Red Dead Redemption 2. <coughs> First of all, tuberculosis is not a pretty disease, it's messy and constant. There's a lot of coughing and wheezing, eating is difficult as the body can't metabolise and doesn't want food. The only replenishment is sleep. The game portrays this quite accurately, to the point where it hurts to watch. Arthur coughs constantly, sometimes with blood, and he can often be heard wheezing with exhaustion. From a gameplay perspective, Arthur's cores are difficult to maintain. His stamina core depletes at a much quicker rate, and he can no longer eat much to replenish them. The only way to increase his health and stamina is through sleep, but of course even that doesn't help for long. Author Eric Gumeni wrote an article for Polygon, comparing the game's depiction of tuberculosis to his own experience with cystic fibrosis, a genetic lung disorder. Gumeni wrote that, while growing up, people would often wince when he coughed, or become angry and tell him that he should have stayed home. They were hostile towards him, despite knowing nothing about him or his condition. The same is true of Arthur in Red Dead Redemption 2. Even his fellow gang members become hostile towards him. You just worry about that cough. You know, they, they say the sick delude themselves. There he is, old Black Lung Morgan. Shut up. Of course, tuberculosis is not the only disease that impacted the Old West, nor is it the only one that has had an impact to the world of Red Dead Redemption 2. The town of Armadillo in 1907 has been almost completely overrun by cholera, an infection of the small intestine. It is essentially a ghost town, besides the near-empty saloon, the familiar general store, and the multiple fires lit around town. In what is considered the fourth major cholera outbreak of the 19th century, such a site was not too uncommon. The town of Boston, Indiana was almost completely abandoned, with only one family said to have remained. In Aurora, Indiana, fires were lit at street crossings in an attempt to purify the air and stop the spread of the disease. Even with a small, non-story related town like Armadillo, Rockstar has made an effort to use real historical events and information to give life to its historical setting. Rockstar Games has made a name for itself over more than 20 years for many reasons, but I wouldn't say that historical accuracy is one of them. When people think of historical games, they think of Assassin's Creed, or Age of Empires, or Kingdom Come Deliverance, certainly not the creators of Grand Theft Auto. But as this and my previous two videos have shown, Rockstar does not shy away from developing and publishing games that take heavy inspiration from real world events, and if these last three games are any indication, they do a pretty fine job of it too. Thanks for watching. Special thank you to my supporters on Patreon for sticking by me. For downloadable and educational versions of my videos and bonus content like annotated scripts and audio commentaries, head over to my Patreon at patreon.com/realpixels.